So here's three blocks connected by a set of strings. And two of the blocks are hanging from the strings, while this middle block is sitting on a flat table between these two pulleys. Now we're going to say there's some coefficient of friction between this block and the table, since it's typically that friction that gives people trouble when solving a problem like this. Now the big question we're tackling here is whether or not this system is going to move. And if it does move, what's the acceleration of the system? See, this is really a big tug of war between these two hanging blocks. In the frictionless case, things are pretty easy. If one block is heavier than the other, then everything's going to get drugged toward that heavier side. It's only when the blocks are perfectly equal in weight that the system sits in equilibrium. But things change when we add friction into the problem here. See, the force of friction always resists the motion between two objects. So here, friction works to keep the center block from moving either to the left or the right. That means if this block on the right is heavier than the block on the left, and everything tries to slide to the right, then friction will act to the left, opposing that motion. Now on the other hand, if the block on the left is heavier, then friction is going to act to the right to oppose that motion. Now in this problem, since this green block right here, M2, is sitting on a level surface, friction only has a finite value. That is to say, the friction force is given by mu Fn, where mu is the coefficient of friction between this block and the surface. And Fn, the normal force, in this case, is going to be equal to the weight of the block. That's because this block isn't accelerating vertically, so the normal force upward between the block and the table needs to be equal to the weight of the block downward. And this friction term can only grow so large, it can't grow infinitely. And what that means is if we make one of these blocks heavy enough, the whole system is going to move. What we need to do here is look at whether or not the system is going to accelerate, given certain values of m1, m2, m3, and of course mu. See, when we add in friction to this problem, the heavier of the two hanging blocks not only has to overcome the weight of the opposing block, it also has to overcome the force of friction right here as well. And what that means for us is rather than having equilibrium only occur when these masses are perfectly equal, there's actually a range of masses over which absolutely nothing's going to happen. So turning that concept into math, so long as the maximum possible friction force is greater in magnitude, that's these little absolute value symbols, then the difference in the hanging weights, again a magnitude, and nothing's going to go anywhere. Now I say magnitude because we don't really care about the direction of either friction or the difference in these weights. It's just as long as friction is stronger than the difference in the weights, nothing's going anywhere. Now expanding out this term for friction, we get this, a simple mathematical check to see if our little system of blocks here is going to accelerate. So if you plug in your numbers and you find the magnitude of this friction force is greater than this difference in weights, then the friction is going to keep the whole system from moving. That is to say, the system is going to remain at rest, assuming we released it from rest. So now we can determine whether or not the system is going to accelerate, which means we need to look at what's going to happen if we make this block, say this one on the right side, much, much heavier than the one on the left. Heavy enough that even friction can't keep this system in equilibrium. Now there's two ways to solve for the acceleration of these blocks when this happens. There's the quote proper way using a system of equations in Newton's laws. And I'll show you how to do that, but there's actually an easier way to view this problem. So imagine we took these blocks and sort of condensed them together as to one connected unit. And rather than being draped over pulleys, these blocks were just being pulled in opposite directions at each end by forces that just happen to equal their weights. See, by making this whole problem one-dimensional, I think things are a little bit easier to view. In this example, the force to the right is larger, so the blocks are going to be drugged to the right, meaning friction between the central block and the table here is going to act to the left. And looking at the problem this way, there's nothing too scary here. If we say to the right is positive, we've got three forces, one in the positive direction and two in the negative direction. And all we're going to do is plug these three forces into Newton's second law, and allow them to act on these three blocks which are really connected and we can view as one unit. So we're really only using Newton's second law once here. So starting right here we've got m3g to the right and then we've got m1g acting to the left so I'm going to say that's negative and then we've got the friction force between m2 and the table that's also to the left so that's going to be in the negative direction. 
And these three forces are the net force acting on this system of three blocks. So we're going to set that equal to the total mass of our system, that's m1 plus m2 plus m3. And those three blocks are going to accelerate at some rate a. And that's the acceleration we're trying to solve for. So rearranging this for a, we get an equation that's going to tell us the acceleration of the system as a function of the masses and friction within the system. Now, if you truly want to master what's going on in this problem, we need to look at the proper solution on how to do this. Because this, this simplified solution takes a few shortcuts, and if you're looking at something like the AP exams or something like JEE or A-level exams, they're going to get at the concepts that are hiding out in this problem, not just a quick way to calculate an outcome. You see, going back to our original setup, what we have are three independent objects. So what we're going to do is apply Newton's second law independently to each of those three objects and create a system of equations for them. You see, applying Newton's second law first to this block over here, there's this tension in the left string acting upward on the block, and there's this force by gravity acting downward on it. Now, if I say upward here is positive, then we're going to have TL minus M1G equals the net force acting on this block. That's M1A. Now, I actually want to hold off on this block right here in the middle for a second. Let's go over this block over here on the right now. You see, if we said the upward motion of this block over here on the left was positive, that would actually correlate to the downward motion of this block on the right. And so while I said up was positive here, I'm actually going to say downward is positive over here on the right-hand side. So when we apply Newton's second law to this block right here, we're going to have M3G downward minus the tension in the string. And one of the big concepts that people mess up in this problem is that this tension in this right string is not equal to the tension in the left string. It's likely to come up on something like an AP exam that people will miss if they just sort of blow through the simplified version of this problem. Now I'll explain why these two tensions can't be the same in a minute here when we look at this central block. But let's finish this up here. We've got this M3G minus T is equal to M3A. That's just Newton's law applied to this block here. Now the issue here is, if you look at this equation and this equation over here, we have an unknown tension on the left, an unknown acceleration, and then an unknown tension on the right. That is three unknowns, and of course we only have two equations. So what we're going to need to do is look at this central block here, which quite literally and mathematically is tying everything together. You see, if we apply Newton's second law to this central block, we've got saying to the right is positive, we have the tension on the right minus the tension on the left would equal M2A in the frictionless case, but because there's friction in this problem, we need to put friction in here. Now that friction could be to the right or the left, depending on which side is heavier here. So I'm just going to leave this as plus or minus friction here. We'll look at how to make that situational a little bit later on. Now friction we can expand to say mu Fn, which in this case we know is mu times M2G. And what this leaves us with across the whole page here now are three equations with three unknowns. So what we're going to do is rearrange this equation on the left for t, this equation on the right for t, and then sub them in here. And in doing that, we get an equation for the acceleration of this system as a function of the masses and mu. Now remember, the direction of this friction force is dependent on which side is heavier. Now if we're at this point in the problem, we should have already determined, based on which block was heavier, which way the system is going to go. So if this top block is going to accelerate to the right, then we're going to say this friction is in the negative direction because it's opposing that motion. And if the top block is going to accelerate to the left, then friction is going to be in the positive direction since, again, it's opposing that motion. So there it is, both the long and short ways to work this problem out. I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.